Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and today I'm going to give you a beginner's guide to Punnett squares. There are a few mistakes that students always make when they're doing Punnett squares, so I, I hope to kind of clear those up. First of all, we should talk about the namesake. This is Reginald Punnett. Uh, he didn't really work with Punnett squares, however, he did work with genetics quite a bit. He did work with mimicry in the uh, butterflies, and so uh, his name is probably associated with uh, genetics just as much as, as Mendel. And it's through the use of the Punnett square. Now, the Punnett square is often overused as just a quick way to solve genetics problems without really understanding what's going on with the genetics. And so I want to kind of get to that root. And if you could remember one thing from this whole video podcast, it's this right here. The two sides of a Punnett square represent the alternatives after meiosis. In other words, you have a bunch of genes and you give half of those genes to a sperm or an egg. And, and that happens through meiosis. And so the organization of those gametes, this case is just a monohybrid cross, are going to be on either side of this, just like a flip of the coin. This would be for one parent, and then this would be the other parent on the other side. And so what do the boxes on a Punnett square stand for? They simply stand for all the alternatives that could occur if we had mating between each of these different gametes. And so let's get to some examples, and hopefully that'll help. So we're going to start with a monohybrid cross. A monohybrid cross is simply a cross that is looking at one trait. And so let's do one that's really, really simple. And so let's say we're crossing purple flowers that are homozygous purple with those that are homozygous white flowers. In other words, this is the dominant trait, this is the recessive trait. And so if you look at the parents, what you want to do first of all is figure out what are the possible gametes that could be produced in meiosis. In other words, this one could either give a big P or it could give a big P. What does that mean? It can only give one thing. It can only give a big P or that dominant allele. And so if you're doing a, a problem like this, you don't even need a big Punnett square. One parent can only contribute big P. So let's look at the other parent. The other parent can either give a little p, and I try to make them really small, or a little p, because p's look the same. And so the other parent can only give a little p. And so we could put that on the other side. And so what are the opportunities that we could have as far as fertilization goes? Well, this one's automatically going to give a big P. The other one's going to give a little P. And so this is the only possible outcome we could get between a cross of a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive. And so you don't really need a big Punnett square. Now you could do that. You could fill it in, big P over here, little P over here. But if you do that, you're going to get the same thing in all of the boxes. And so it's still a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. In other words, 100% of the time you're going to have that. Okay, so let's get to one that's a little more complicated. Let's say we have a heterozygous cross. And so this is for um, purple flowers as well. Well, if you look at this one, now the problem's changed a little bit. This one could give a big P, but it also could give a little P. And so we have to show both of those possible gametes of meiosis. And so this would be the big P, and then this would be the little P over here. So half of the time it's going to give the big P, half of the time it's going to give the little P. If we look at the other parent, same thing. It's going to give the big P half of the time, and it's going to give the little P half of the time as well. So we're going to put that here. Now we simply fill in the boxes. And so this would be a big P with a big P, because I'm taking this here and that there. This is going to go over to here to give us a big P and a little P. By convention, we usually write the dominant allele first. So that would be one alternative here. Here would be a big P, little p as well. So we get the big P here and the little p here. And then finally, we're going to get little p over here and a little p over here, since they're each contributing a little p. And so what do we get from this cross? Well, we get a 1 to 2, since these are exactly the same, to 1 genotypic ratio, because the genotype is the letter. So there's one that's like this, there's two that look like this, and there's one that looks like that. So that's going to be our 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. What about phenotypic? Well, this one's going to be a purple flower, and so are these other two. And so if we're looking at the phenotypic ratio, the phenotypic ratio now is going to be a 3 to 1 ratio. We're going to have three purple to every one white that we have. Okay, let's try another one. Let's say we're looking at incomplete dominance. So incomplete dominance, a snapdragon would be an example of that. A snapdragon has two genes. If it has a red gene and a white gene, then it's going to be pink. And so this one actually has two alleles that it can contribute and the same on the other side. And so we just write those out. So this would be the parent. This would be a 50% chance of giving the red, 50% chance of the white. And then the same thing on this side over here. 
So now if we fill in our Punnett square, like that, what do we get for all the different choices? Well, now we have a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio, but we also have a 1 to 2 to 1 phenotypic ratio. So if you're doing a question where it's incomplete dominance, you use a Punnett square the same way. Um, Codominance would be the same way. Uh, the difference is in incomplete dominance, the heterozygous or the hybrids are going to be somewhere between the two. If it's codominance, they'll actually they're going to express both of those genes, both of those proteins. And now let's try one that's a, a sex-linked chromosome or an X-linked chromosome. And so in this one, we've got a parent. So this is a mom because she's XX chromosome and she's a carrier of, let's say, color blindness, the gene. And this is a dad that's normal. And so I'm going to put dad up here, X, Y, because half of the time he's going to give the X and half of the time he's going to give the Y. If we put mom over here, I'm going to put that carrier up there, she is not colorblind because she has one deficient gene, colorblind gene, but she has another gene that works well on her other X chromosome. So if I fill in this one here, it's going to be X, C, X. So this would be a female because two X chromosomes, but they're going to be a carrier of that gene. If we look down here, this would just be a normal female. If we look down here, I'm grabbing the X from here and the Y from up there. So that'd be XY, so that'd be a normal male. And then if we look at this one right here, this would be a male who's colorblind. The reason he's colorblind is that he doesn't have an X chromosome or another gene as a backup copy to that. So those are monohybrid crosses, and usually students do fairly well on those. Next are dihybrid crosses, and this is where the mistake really starts. And so if we look at this parent, this is a typical dihybrid cross. Um, let me tell you what the letters stand for. The R stands for round pea seeds and the Y stands for yellow seeds. If it's the, the recessive, that stands for wrinkled. And if it's a little Y, that stands for green. And so we're looking at a dye hybrid, so that means two traits. We're looking at seed shape, round or wrinkled, and seed color, yellow or green. So now we have to do a dye hybrid cross. And so the tendency, if we look at this parent, the tendency is to see that there are four letters over here, there's four boxes over here, and then you just simply write them out. Big R, little r, big Y, little y, and then you get a weird answer and you don't know what to do with it, okay? That's wrong, that's a mistake, okay? Whenever you're figuring out the gametes, remember that you have to give one of each letter. In other words, each of the gametes is gonna have one of each of the alleles. And so let me clear this mess out of the way. So what do we do? Let's say this parent right here, and I'm gonna write it up here so it makes a little more sense. Big R, little r, big Y, little y. What possibilities could they produce? So they're giving one of each letter, remember? Well, they could give the big R and the big Y. So big R, big Y, that'd be one possibility. They could also give the big R and the little y. So they could give the big R, little y. They could also give the little r big Y or the little r little y. Since they're giving one of each color, there's only four, one of each letter, excuse me, they, there's only four possibilities that they can give. So it's getting to be kind of a mess, but those are the four right here. And so those four are going to go across the top. So we've got big R big Y, big R little y, little r big Y, little r little y. So those are the four gametes that you could produce. In other words, with this parent, you can only get four combinations of each of the two letters. Um, same thing down this side. So it's going to be same thing on uh, written down this side because this other parent is going to be exactly the same. Okay, so it would take me a long time to write all of those out. So let me throw those in here. So these would be the parents, all the possible gametes you could get. And if I fill those in, these first nine, if you look at them, let me... Let me get a color that's different. Let me grab a yellow color. And so this one right here is going to be round and it's going to be yellow. So it's going to be round and yellow. And this one you can see it's going to be round and yellow and 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 round and yellow. In other words, nine of them are going to be round and yellow in shape. And the only reason why is that the R is dominant and so you could have one like this where they're hybrid for both and they're still going to be round and yellow and so let me try to add the next ones so what about these next ones well the next ones are going to be round and green so let me get a different color 
So these ones are going to be round and green because the round is dominant, but they don't have the dominant for the yellow. So they're not going to be, let me get rid of that. Let's add the next ones. So these ones are going to be wrinkled and yellow. So again, I got to get a different pen. So these ones are going to be wrinkled and yellow. And then if we look at the last one, it's going to get all of the recessive alleles. And so that one's going to be getting green. It's going to be green and wrinkled. Okay. And so when we say there's a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, that's just a, a typical dihybrid cross. Um, we're going to have nine of the phenotypes that are round and yellow, three of the phenotypes that are round and green, three of the phenotypes that are yellow and wrinkled, and then only one of the ones that's not. And that's only going to work if you are able to set up your gametes correctly on the, on the, on the side. Um, now it's super hard for you to answer a question like this on a test. You're rarely going to have to draw a dihybrid cross. But it's important that you understand the concept of it because most of the genes inside your body are not caused by one gene, they're caused by multiple genes. So how tall you are is caused by probably a dozen different genes inside your body. So you can imagine how big the Punnett square is going to be for that. Um, an example of uh, that I'll leave you with would be this one. So let's say we have a parent here, and the parent is big R, little r, big Y, little y, little r, little r, little y, little y. The question I'm asking you is, um, how big would your Punnett square have to be? And so you're going to have to figure out what are all the possible gametes that you could get from both of those, and then... Um, then, then draw it out, figure out all the possibilities you can get. If you're thinking it's going to be a four by four, um, you're doing way too much work. And so those are Punnett squares, and I hope that's helpful.